All right, so what we're going to do here is we have this system. We have several parts that are all connected together. And what we would like to do is to find the force carried in the rope. Okay, that's all we, that's all we care about. We don't care about anything else here. We, as long as we can find the force carried in the rope, we are good to go. Okay, we have some dimensions. We have a force of two kilonewtons on there. What should we do first? A free body diagram. What should we do a free body diagram of? Okay. Maybe there should be two, okay? You know, or generalizing it, maybe we should have more than one, right? Maybe we need a multiple number of free body diagrams. That's one of the possibilities here because we have a system where there are multiple bodies all uh, represented up there. So what do you want to do first? Okay, well, I'll say this. One of the things that you probably want to do is to separate bodies that the rope affects, okay? Because what that does is once you separate them, you can identify the effect of the rope on those bodies, okay? So like, like how? If I'm saying separate bodies that the rope affects, what are we saying? Okay, yeah, ABC might be something that would be good to go ahead and do a free body diagram all by itself. Okay, so I'm going to do that again. I've, I've shared with you guys before that when you have a lot of time at your disposal, it's a good idea to do a, a accurate sketch that really looks like the body that is given to you. If you are trying to be quick, then it's okay to make it more minimal. Okay, so that's my little body that I have for ABC, okay? Now here's the thing about a rope, all right? Whenever you have a rope that passes around frictionless pulleys, the tension in the rope remains the same on both sides of where it encounters the pulley, okay? That means if I look to this side of this pulley and I look to this side of this pulley, that rope has the same tension in those two locations. Where else can I do that? Okay, I have right here and right here as well, right? So everywhere I look in this rope, there is only one rope, right? It just passes over a couple of pulleys and changes direction by passing over a couple of pulleys. Everywhere you look, it has the same tension in it. How does that help me? Okay, it's only one unknown. If it's going to be the same everywhere we look at it, the tension in the rope can be... Uh, applied as just one unknown. All right, so what should we do everywhere that the rope attaches, you think? Okay, so we could show a force in the rope up here. What do you want to name it? How about just T? For tension. Okay, so there's one place where I have a force acting in the body, the tension in the rope pulls up at point A. Okay, what else? Okay, the rope also pulls at point C. Okay. With the same tension. Okay, what else? Okay, at B there's a pin and the pin at B constrains motion of this body from being able to move left and right or up and down. So it's not allowed to do either of those things, which means the pin at B has to be putting a force to prevent those types of motion. So in each of those directions. So we basically put on uh, maybe an R, B, Y, and an R, B, X. Okay, what else? Okay, someone says CE, right? There's a member that goes from C to E. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so RBF is going to the right, Y is going to go towards... I don't know what direction it's going. Oh, so I just know that it points in the X direction. Okay. Yeah, and I chose a direction to show it on the diagram. Okay, so since I don't know when I start this problem which direction that force goes, uh, it's okay for me to just show it on there 
one or the other of the two directions. And uh, if we needed to solve for it at some point, uh, the, uh, the sign of the answer that we get tells us whether or not our assumption here at this point was correct. Okay? So it's a good question. What else? Okay. We are going to neglect self-weight. Um, we'll, we'll say that that's a general thing that you can do if you are not given data about the weight of parts, then that's kind of an implicit assumption or an implicit instruction to you that it's okay to neglect the self-weight. So I'll just go ahead and declare we're neglecting self-weight. And then on the third fourth of C from the link. Okay, there's a link that goes from C to E, and there should be a force applied here. Which direction would you like to show that force? Okay. Okay, someone says down and to the right. Okay, anyone disagree? Okay, we'll go down and to the right. Does it really matter? No, again, if you don't know what direction to draw that arrow, don't worry too much about it. Just draw it. Okay, you, you need to get the line of action correct, like which, what line it's on, but you don't necessarily have to get the arrow correct as far as whether it points one direction along that line or the opposite direction along that line. What would you like to name this force? Okay, maybe FCE. All right, good so far. Now what would you like to do? Okay, so we probably want to do a few things like establish some dimensions. All right, so let me do this. I'm going to show here an x-axis and relative to that x-axis how far is it up to uh, where this uh, tension in the rope is applied? Okay. Yeah, we've got one meter here plus another one and a half meters there. That gives us what? 2.5 meters? Okay. What else? Okay, um, so someone says the distance from like the x-axis up to where point E is applied, okay. I will say I don't think we need that so much on this. Um, what I think we do need is how far is it from point B to point A, okay, which is three meters. Okay, now one thing we do need that is related to the suggestion that was made a second ago is we do need to know the direction of FCE, which I recommend that we do that with a slope, because that is more directly related to the information that's actually given in the problem. Okay, So what we can see there is that there is a rise of 1.5 meters over a run of what? 3.5 meters. So I can just put here that this should be 1.5, and this should be 3.5. And that's enough information to have specified the direction of the line of action of FCE. Okay. Anything else that I'm missing does it look like? It actually looks pretty good to me uh, at this stage. So, um, okay, yeah, I forgot to put my y-axis on there. Yeah, that's, that would probably be a good idea as well. <clears throat> but now that I've got that on there, I actually think that it, uh, it looks pretty decent. Okay, what's the problem? I've got too many variables. Okay, I have four unknowns on that free body diagram. This is what kind of a force system? That particular part, ABC, is a non concurrent force system, which means I have up to three equations that I can apply to it, which means I've got too many unknowns for my number of equations. Okay. Someone says you could do a moment. Here's the only issue with trying to do a moment to try to eliminate some variables. Okay. I need to find a place where I can reduce this thing down to only uh, three variables. Okay. Do I have a point I can sum moments around that does that for me? Okay. B would eliminate RBY and RBX, but it would not eliminate T or F sub CE. Uh, 
Um, you can, and that's something we will do, is take FCE and put it in terms of rise and run. But all that does is it takes and, and lets us find the X component and the Y component, but it's still there as an unknown. Okay? I'll go ahead and tell you, there isn't a point, there isn't one point I can sum moments around that eliminates enough things. And then if I add an X equation, I have to have RBX in there. And if I ha add a Y equation, I have to have RBY in there. So there really isn't anything we can do with just this free body diagram uh, to solve for everything. But that's not to say that we are in bad shape. What else can we do? Yeah, we have another free body diagram that we can draw, right? It's over there. It's D-E-G-H. OK. <clears throat> and what kind of forces apply to D-E-G-H? OK. Up at the top at H, there's a 2 kilonewton force that's applied at a specified angle. Okay, that angle is 20 degrees relative to the Y. Okay, that's one good one. What else? Okay, um, we do have at uh, point E, we have the force that's going to be in member CE. Okay, so I'll, I'll show that down here. What direction should I show that force? Up and to the left, someone says. Why? Okay. Newton's third law says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? So I need to show that one the opposite direction of the one that I showed on the other free body diagram. So FCE there. Okay. What else? The pin. So I'll kind of do the same thing down there. We'll call this RDX, and this I'll call RDY. What else? OK. Yeah, I have another force that acts right here. And let's be kind of careful to think, um, how exactly does that force get applied? OK. Let me do it this way. Uh, I'm going to draw another little miniature free body diagram of just the pulley. Okay, so there's the pulley, and we're saying that the pulley has a tension in a rope coming off like this, and another one up here coming off like this, each of which are T. And where the pin is at the middle, right, it has to react against that. What kind of force has to act at the pin to react against those forces? Okay, a force this way of what magnitude? Okay, so this is, should be 2T, and so that tells me that 2T is what gets applied at point G. Okay. Okay, so again, it is because of Newton's third law, right. what's causing that force at point G is the pin of the pulley, right. right? And what we're saying here is that the forces applied from the ropes onto the pulley go to the left, meaning the reaction uh, at the pin on the pulley side has to go to the right, but that means that the pulley puts a force on the bracket to the left, right? All right, what else do we need on our free body diagram? Okay. We need dimensions, like what? Like four meters, right? I could show that right here, for instance. What else? Okay, maybe I'll show my x-axis here, and I might need to know how, how high is it from that x-axis to where. Okay. Okay, I'd actually say this is two and a half plus one half. That means this is three meters. Do you agree with that? Okay. What else? Okay, yeah, right. So like right here, 
I would need to know how high this is, and it looks like it's just one meter. above the x-axis. Okay? What else? Okay, I didn't put my y-axis on there yet. I'll put that on there. Anything else you can think of that we need on this free body diagram? We're missing one thing. Okay, yeah, the direction of FCE, someone says. So, what do I do there? Okay, it's again a rise of one and a half for a run of three and a half. Okay, and what I have here are two free body diagrams. How many unknowns do I have total? Okay, so I had four over on the left free body diagram. I move over to the right one. It adds two more unique ones, RDX and RDY but the T and the FCE I already had, right? So that brings me up to a grand total of six equations, or six, excuse me, six unknowns, and I can do six equations uh, for these because I have two non-concurrent force systems. So each of them can, I can do up to three equations, okay? Which means at worst, I have a six by six system, right? It's not too bad. Okay. Good news is we don't have to go to our worst case scenario here. Okay. Remember that one of the things you can do is pick shrewdly where you take moments. Okay. And where is a good place to take a moment, you think? For let's let's look first at the left free body diagram. Where's a good place to take a moment for that diagram? Okay, someone says point B. Why is point B a good place? All right. Okay. We don't care about RBX or RBY. Okay. Not for this question anyway. We don't know. We don't care what those values actually turn out to be. And so, if we eliminate those variables, it's great. Right. So, if we pick point B, the resulting equations eliminate those two variables, and that's fine. We don't necessarily care that it, that those are eliminated. Okay. So, how would I do a sum of moments about point B for the first free body diagram? Okay, that's A, B, C. Okay. First you choose a positive direction. You say you're going to sum moments about point B. Okay. And you're choosing, say, counterclockwise to be positive. Then what? Okay. We would have T times 3 meters. What direction? Yeah, clockwise, which means we'd count it as negative. So negative T times 3 meters. Okay. Then I would have another negative T times what? 2.5 meters from that other value, right, the other uh, place where T is applied. Okay. Then what? Okay. FCE and... Right, so you guys are on the right track with that. FCE, I don't care what the vertical component is because if I actually draw those two components on there, you would see that it would have a component that goes horizontally and one that goes vertically. How is that line of action of the vertical component oriented relative to point B? It goes straight through it, straight through it means it doesn't create a moment about point B, right? So I do not care about that component. I only care about the, uh, the one that goes to the right, okay? So how do I take FCE and only get the component of it that goes to the right? Okay, I use our little formulation that we've used. I take the, uh, the run, the 3.5, and divide by what? The square root of the rise squared plus run squared. Okay, and so far with that much, all I've done is picked off the uh, horizontal component of that force. What else do I need? Okay, yeah, this one I also multiply by 2.5 meters because that's how far away the line of action is of that horizontal component of force away from point B. Okay, what else? 
Does this, should that be positive or negative? negative? Okay, negative because it tends to try to rotate it uh, clockwise. Okay. Any other forces that tend to create moments around point B? That's it. Okay, if we're neglecting self-weight, there isn't anything else. Okay, now what? All right. Notice here we can do a very similar process on the other free body diagram. Okay. And when we do that, if we do the, the sum of moments around point D, it will eliminate RDX and RDY. Okay. So let's do that for body, uh, let's see, DEGH. Okay, we're going to sum moments about point D. Again, I'll take counterclockwise to be positive. And now I need to evaluate all of the forces that would tend to create moments for that body. Like what? Okay, tell you what, I'm actually, I'd prefer to start with the T's. Okay, it'll put everything kind of in the same order. 2T creates what kind of a tendency to rotate about point D? Counterclockwise, counterclockwise. so I have positive. 2t times what? Three. Times 3 meters. Okay. I do have my 2 kilonewtons. I tell you what, let me save that one for the last. Let me go to FCE F, uh, next. Okay. For FCE, do I care about both components or is there one or the other I could eliminate? You can eliminate the vertical. Yeah, we do not. You see that? It would be the combination of a force that goes up and one to the left and the one that goes up there I don't care about okay because its line of action passes through point D so I only care about the horizontal component of it and so how do I pick off just that yeah same as I did before right 3.5 over the square root of 3.5 squared plus 1.5 squared Okay, right, and someone says we also need to multiply it by the, the length, the distance from the line of action of that horizontal component down to point D, and that is this one meter that we see right here. So I put one meter. What tendency to rotate is that? Counterclockwise. Okay, so I say plus there, okay. And again, the vertical component doesn't matter, so we're done with FCE. What's next? Two kilonewtons. Okay. How do I deal with the two kilonewtons? Okay. It also has vertical and horizontal components, and actually for this one, both of them create tendencies to rotate uh, around point D. So I have to deal with both of them, and I'll deal with them one at a time. Which one would you like to start with? Okay, the vertical one first, someone says. So to get that vertical component of force, I take two kilonewtons and multiply by what? Cosine of 20 degrees. Okay, why am I picking cosine? Right, this location right here, where I'm measuring the 20 degrees, that is adjacent to that component of force, right? So I need the cosine uh, function for that purpose. And then I need to take that force and multiply it by four meters because that is the horizontal length uh, which I combine with a vertical component in order to get that uh, contribution. So I have, whoop, not three, I have four meters. And what direction? Negative. Clockwise, so we count that as a negative. Okay, then what? Now I need to take the horizontal component. So I take for that two kilonewtons times the sine, 20 degrees. And how far away is that line of action from point D? Three meters. Okay, that is three meters away. Positive or negative? Positive. Okay, this one is positive because it does tend to create a counterclockwise tendency to rotate. Okay, so that is plus any other forces I have that would create moments about D. I think that's it. Yeah. Now what do we have? 
we have two equations and two unknowns. And they are linear equations. Two linear equations and two unknowns means we are in good shape here. Okay? Matter of fact, look, I've already got the system solver pulled up here. It means I can start putting in coefficients of my variables. So for the first equation for body ABC, what are the what should the coefficient be of my variable T? Yeah, so you you kind of factor out the T, and that basically makes a you know negative three minus two point five, right? But why even do that math mentally, right? Just if you can make the calculator do it, just make the calculator do it, right? All right, what's next? Okay. Here I'll put in negative 3.5. Okay, actually let me go ahead and get this uh, 2.5 2 there as well, times 2.5. Then what? Divide it by square root of 3.5 squared uh, plus 1.5 squared. Okay, do I have a constant term in this equation? Nope. Okay, so I'm done with that expression. Next, I'll go to the, the expression down here. Okay, what, should, what is my coefficient of t for body DEGH? Okay, 6. Or I could put in, if I wanted, 2 times 3. Because I don't trust my arithmetic. If I don't trust that arithmetic, I'm in bad shape. But, you know. <clears throat> All right, then for FCE, it's positive what? 3.5, I'll say 3.5 times 1, right? You didn't really need to do that, but divide by square root of 3.5 squared plus 1.5 squared, okay? And that gets me that uh, value in there. Here it gets just a little bit tricky because I do have a constant term in this equation. And remember that, at least for this calculator, it's looking for that constant term to be on the right side of the equals, okay? Which means, since I have it on the left side of the equals, I need to negate both of those terms, okay? So I'm going to do a positive 2 cosine 20 times 4, all right? 2 times cosine 20 degrees times 4 meters. Then what? Minus, Minus 2 times the sine, 20 degrees, times 3 meters. And now that I've got all of those in there, I hit equals. And what is this first variable? Okay, this was the first variable that I was um, entering coefficients for in my solver, which is t, right? And so t ends up being 1.438. kilonewtons. And that is what we were trying to find. Okay. In case we're curious, we can check FCE as well. Before I hit it, anyone have any thoughts? So I have a few people saying we think we did it wrong. Who says we think we did it wrong? The sign. Yeah, what direction we assumed for FCE. Yeah, the direction we assume may be wrong. Okay? These, these people here are confident, right? They are staking their reputation on this, and they are correct. <laughs> they say they have nothing to lose. Um, and that's, that is correct. The, they were, uh, we were incorrect whenever we chose our direction for FCE. Um, let's physically interpret that real quick. FCE, the direction we showed it, did we assume that FCE was carrying tension or compression? Okay. I hear a couple of votes, vo uh, votes that say we assumed it was in compression, and now we got a negative, which means it's in tension. Who says they think that's right? Okay. I think I have one person saying, no, I don't think that's, that's actually what we did there. Okay. So let's think about this. 
that little member, if I was to draw a little free body diagram of member uh, CE, okay, I'll just show it right here. Based on the direction that we showed our arrows, remember this is point C, this is point E, based on the direction we showed the arrows on our diagram over here, okay, if FCE at point C pulls uh, point C downward and to the right for body ABC, that means it's pulling point C up and to the left for this body based on Newton's third law and vice versa down here. And what direction do we, based on our assumed arrows, what direction do we assume we were putting force in member CE? Okay, we assumed tension the way we drew our arrows. And we solved, got a negative, which means what? We conclude it was actually in compression. Okay. This is, it takes a little while to kind of get all of that uh, solid in your mind, which is why I take the time and, uh, and mention that each time. But yes, we do assume that member CE carries a compressive force uh, of whatever that was, 3.443. kilonewtons, okay? <clears throat> All right, any questions before we move on? You got a question? Yes. What you have to do is you have to look at the member itself. If the forces applied to the member tend to make it longer, then that is tension. If the forces applied to a member tend to make it shorter, that's compression. And if you look at these arrows, the, uh, the little red arrows here imply that you're taking that member and trying to pull it longer, right? Which means that we assumed it was in tension. Then we ran through all this work, got to the end, found a negative value for FCE, meaning that our assumption of tension is incorrect. It's actually in compression. Positive and negative. So positive means your assumption at the beginning was correct. Negative means your assumption at the beginning was incorrect. Okay? So that's because you can either assume positive or, t or, or excuse me, you can either assume tension or compression. Right? That's up to you to decide. We arbitrarily chose FCE to point down and to the right over at point uh, C. Right? By doing that, we assumed that that member was in tension. Got that? Yeah. Awesome. Yes, sir. So there's probably not a great way to do it other than what I showed you here. If I apply a force up and to the left on point C and downward and to the right on point E, then that would tend to make member CE get longer. Would you agree? If it was made of a rubber band and you pulled on it in that way, then it would get longer in that direction. So that means that it's in tension, okay? Um, if, if on the other hand, I uh, pushed in the other direction, right? This is not what we did, but let's say that we assumed it went this way, right? That would mean that I would be assuming that I had a compressive force in member CE. And if I had had that, then over here, these two arrows would have been reversed from what I actually had, right? And if those two arrows were reversed, then I would have run through my whole problem, and this value at the end would have wound up not having that negative sign there. What, what's a rubber band in tension? A rubber band can only carry tension. Okay. A rubber band is similar to a rope or a string. Uh, ropes and strings, flexible elements like that can only carry tension. They are unable to carry a compressive force. All right. Anything else? Wonderful.